Okay, so <coughs> off you go. All right, everybody. So here we are. Though we are a minute away from kickoff today, mm -hmm. and uh, if you could please post in the chat where you're joining us from today, we'd love to know. I'm in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Graham is in Mexico City in Mexico. Where are you, Mari Carmen? I am in Coventry in the UK, England. Um, and Heike? Um, how about you, Heike? I'm in Germany in Heidelberg. Okay. And where is Mystery Pooch from? <laughs> Mystery Pooch is in Never Neverland. All right. <laughs> Uh, okay, so Gail is in Italy, Anzio. Where is Anzio, Gail? Is it in the north? I don't know. Sorry. Anzio, Italy. Hmm? Can you type? <laughs> Question is, so would you like people to still unmute? No, no. Okay, because I've. I would uh, say no. We have no, to we'll... the unmute button for until the question and answers. Is that okay, everyone? Yeah. If yeah, you want I... to be, if you want to be speaking, raise your hand. You can do this, you know, in, in Zoom, with this raise hand button, which we don't mm -hmm. have now. So... Yeah. Anyway, but I think I think Heike Murray Carmen it. will will be presenting and then she'll be asking people to use the chat box yeah. to respond to some questions and then at the end of the presentation Mary Carmen you'll be um, asking people if they want to yeah. ask questions using voice and that's mm -hmm. when we can have we can unmute people so Excellent. I'm going to go ahead and introduce you Mary Carmen Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay uh, before you do, sorry, before you do okay. that, I want sorry, to do the Vicky. formal, the formal welcome. Welcome everybody to our LT Sync Fridays, uh, uh, which is probably the last LT Sync Friday because we are probably going to move events to uh, the weekend uh, mm -hmm. because some people are going back to classes, to formal classes, uh, and not being at home. So. Uh, we might have to change um, to weekends, okay? But you'll know in advance, we, also, we are also moving to a monthly uh, webinar with LTSIG instead of every Friday. Uh, I'm Vicky Saumel, I'm uh, the LTSIG Joint Coordinator, and uh, we are really happy to have you all here. Um, Graham, our newsletter editor, is going to introduce Mari Carmen's session today. Thank you, Vicky. Um, I'm very happy that Mary Carmen was able to join us today for this presentation on reflections on video remote teaching in challenging circumstances. Uh, before I hand over to her, let me just introduce her. Um, Mary Carmen Gamero is a PhD candidate and associate tutor at the University of Warwick where she also teaches Spanish and English language courses to undergraduate and graduate students and show training courses to visiting language teachers. She's worked as an online and on-site teacher trainer and language teacher in Venezuela since 2008. Her main research interest is teacher education in video remote teaching and she runs her own Facebook page and YouTube channel. For mm -hmm. the links, go and see the uh, IATEPO LTC uh, web page um, titled eEduCritical in which mm -hmm. she shares online tools, reflections and interviews on online teaching and learning. Now I was very fortunate at the IATEFL con conference, not this year because it has been deferred, but the year before mm -hmm. to see Mary Carmen speak about remote teaching and found uh, she had lots of uh, very interesting, fascinating insights uh, into this through her work. So I'm very much looking forward to this and I hope that you all enjoy uh, it too. Over to you, Mary Carmen. 
Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you everyone for being here. It's a pleasure to see you all here. I can see some familiar names. And thank you very much for the lovely introduction. I feel really flattered by that introduction. Uh, now I'm going to share uh, mm -hmm. my presentation. And please feel free to write any comment or any question in the chat box. I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to address them. Um, maybe I'm on the slides when I'm checking the slides or presenting them. And of course, at the end, if you have any question and you would like to say something, you can activate your microphone at the end of the presentation. So as you can see, um, I'm going to be talking about reflections on video remote teaching in challenging circumstances. Um, and in this case, I want to highlight that this is not like the definite truth because there is no definite truth, uh, real truth. This is just one aspect coming from my own experience as a remote teacher and experiences of the teachers I'm working with with my research. So, um, the purpose of the presentation is to create a space for reflection on video remote teaching in challenging times or challenging circumstances, exchange ideas and experiences on implementation of video remote teaching, and of course, present different uses of video conferencing tools. So um, first, I wanted to um, make a difference or find similarities and differences between the terms challenging times or challenging circumstances. So um, I consider that challenging times, when we talk about challenging times, we are referring to a specific moment or a specific period of time in which there are situations in the context that are affecting the practice of the teachers. So it doesn't necessarily involve challenging circumstances. And of course, with challenging times, we kind of, we are kind of certain that it will finish, it will end at some point. So as an example of challenging times, we can say, uh, we can talk about the pandemic that we're living right now. And um, depending on the place where you are, depending on the country, and of course, depending on the system, um, the country system, you may say that there are challenging circumstances or that there are not. In the case of challenging circumstances, obviously, we can see or we can think about a more general perspective because this one involves um, the conditions of the situation, like infrastructure, social political situation of the country. It may last longer than expected, uh, and you can consider it a challenging time, but it depends how long it is. So an example of challenging circumstances, I can talk about my own country. I come from Venezuela, and Venezuela has been living a situation, a socioeconomical crisis since possibly 10 years ago. So it's been longer than expected. And now the infrastructure and the system of the country it, um, needs a lot of investment. So it means that the infrastructure and the social political situation is um, kind of problematic at the moment. So I wanted to highlight that difference. And what I'm going to present here, these reflections, you can project them or you can think about them in challenging times like the pandemic or challenging circumstances depending on the country that you are at the moment. So let me see if we have any comments. Okay, um, I was just checking the chat box. And um, I also want to emphasize that I'm talking about video remote teaching and I'm referring to when I say video, to asynchronous video, it means video recordings, and synchronous videos referring to video conferencing tools when they are used in online teaching. But I will try to emphasize video conferencing tools because that is the area I'm working in and I'm researching at the same time. And I also am focusing on the teacher because my area of research is teacher education and development. But I'm trying to look at the teacher practice, trying to see what they do with the video conferencing tools, 
how they produce or how they create that video conference in mediated session, how they interact during those sessions, and how they integrate video conferencing tools to their practice or how they reconstruct their practice with video conferencing. And I'm also thinking of the challenges and perceptions of the teachers in terms of their experiences and the issues that they are in, they have been facing um, using video conferencing during these challenging times or in challenging circumstances. So we have, um, I'm just checking the chat box. Hello everyone, I can see um, new people joining in. So we have Liani, Meek, Rita. So welcome, I'm working with them and I know them very close. Um, so um, I'm going to continue. And in this case, I want you to write in the chat box, um, what video conferencing tool are you using at the moment, if you are teaching at the moment, or if you're not, what video conferencing tool have you used in the past for teaching the language? And I would like to know a bit more, I don't know if you can describe your experience using uh, video conferencing tools. So I'm going to be reading some of your answers in the chat box, so if you can um, write. Big blue button. Okay, thank you, Maria. That's the first time I hear about it. And got me, yes. Zoom, big blue button, Microsoft Teams, Skype, Zoom. Can you tell me about your experience? Has it been positive? Has it been challenging? Has it been negative? Or have you started using one and then you decided to change and use another tool? So we can see Blackboard Collaborate, Zoom. I think Zoom is one of the most used tools. Um, Google Meet. So Graham says, I am very familiar with Zoom, but have been forced to switch to Teams, which isn't good, it's good for work. Graham, can you elaborate on that? Why isn't good? What challenges have you faced using Teams? And Heike says, Zoom works well, lots of tools was quite impressed by Google Meet, up to 250 people. Um, challenging in the beginning, Buana, uh, but now I have hung out, hung, hung out it. Okay, so you have learned how to use it. Zoom, Google Meet, and Blackboard Collaborate. So Isabel says it has been challenging because, challenging because we didn't have time to adapt to it, practice, learn, but I feel more confident now. Okay, that's good. Teams is clunky, not as user-friendly, especially for webinars, yeah. So Vicky says, I think for most it was challenging as we had to learn while doing it. Yes, yes, and that is one of the things that um, have emerged in my participants. Um, a bit challenging since my students or mentees kind of a struggle at the beginning due to the lack of technical issues, but all is said now, we have like three months to practice thanks to COVID. <laughs> all right. Okay, so it means that in this case, you have been facing challenges, but you have somehow adapted to it after maybe three months of using the tool. So. There has been like, um, I don't know, a proliferation of tools nowadays because of the pandemic, the pandemic that we're living in. And of course, um, I think the tools, they have been adapted like every day because they are trying to uh, win the competition and to get more users. But I know that the most liked and the most used uh, tools are Zoom, Microsoft Teams, um, Meetup, Slack, Skype, Flock, even Instagram Live, Facebook Live, Google Meet, and WhatsApp. So I'm going to give you the example of one of my participants. He has been using WhatsApp because um, um, he lives in Venezuela. So the conditions in Venezuela with the electricity and the connections, so it means he has 
he has to use his own data. So he prefers to use his phone because his computer um, is not in a good condition to be used for video conferencing. So he has used WhatsApp to give his classes. And well, in general, I think video conferencing is one of the most selective tools because it offers kind of a similar experience to on-site practices. And I mean on-site to the classroom practice. And for example, if you're using video conferencing, you can see, still see the person you're talking to and you can actually perceive nonverbal cues, for example, days, face expressions, movements, the movement of the eyes, for example, their reactions and body language. And this part, and when I say body language, is when the person is showing, showing more than their face. So um, in that case, obviously this has been challenging because um, especially for teacher agency, in most cases, especially in formal education, teachers are told what tools to use. So in that case, there is no chance for consultation or consensus, but the decisions are, the, the decision-making process is done by other people. So the teachers, they simply have to adapt to it. And in that case, um, I should mention that it is easy to judge and maybe you can say, oh, but the teacher can use any tools they like, but no. Once again, they have to stick to the decision of the administration if it is in the case of formal education. Formal education, I mean when the schools or the teachers are part of an education system, government education system. So in this transitional period in which um, technology is being integrated or the practice is being restructured in the middle of a pandemic, so there is some evidence of teacher resilience that somehow links to teacher identity. Okay, so in this case, um, the teachers, they have been resisting an external force. So it means that they have to teach because they, they must do it even though we are in the middle of a pandemic and their own lives um, are under threat because of the virus. So they have been using adaptation strategies to cope with the situation. And that means they have been learning how to use the tool. They have been using tutorials, taking part in courses, becoming part of communities of practice to exchange ideas, and also paying attention to their um, lesson planning, considering the context that they are now teaching in. So it means that the teachers are first adopting a tool, but they, apart from adopting the tool, adopting the tool, they have to learn how to use it. And at the same time, they have to adapt their style and methodology to the tool and not the other way around. Because if we had the chance to make the decision, we could select the tool and adapt the tool to our style and methodology because there is a huge number of tools. But when that happens, so the teachers, they have to deal with the anxiety and the, mo the emotional instability that the students are going through and that the teachers are going through at the same time. So um, in that case, the students and the teachers' productivity um, has been affected. And I would like to mention one of the cases, and this case is from a teacher that, that was using Microsoft Teams with a group of 12 teenage language learners whose ages were between 15 and 17 years. So these teachers started using Microsoft Teams at the beginning of the pandemic. And back then, they only had the chance to see four participants. So that teacher had 12 participants. So they could only see four. And um, there was kind of anxiety and uncomfort, not because it was not possible to see what the rest of the participants were doing, if they were actively engaged or if they actually paying attention. 
So there was a resolution in that case because the teacher realized that there was a need for new activities to get all the students involved. And there was also a recognition of learners' autonomy. And learners' autonomy is it means that the teacher realized that the learners, they have the capacity or they have the agency to make the decision about their own learning process. So in that case, that resolution gave the teacher a different perspective about the teaching and learning process. Because um, so there was a shift in the role from a more, like say, controller type to a more facilitator type considering that the students, they were the center, but the students also made the decision about what to learn and how to learn it. Okay, I'm going to check some of the comments here. Okay, yes, you're discussing about the tools. Meetup, I didn't realize it had video conferencing tool. Good. Okay, perfect. Do you have, if, remember, if you have any question or comment, or if you feel identified with any of the things that I'm mentioning here, you can write a comment in the chat box. So I have some questions for reflection here, and in this case, I need you to write again in the chat box. And I want you to think about your own practice. And one of the questions is, to what aspect are we giving priority during these challenging times or circumstances? Is it to school accountability or is it actually to students learning? Another question for reflection is how flexible are we in our practice during these times that we're living a pandemic? Are we being flexible? Are we accepting that sometimes the students are not going to be in a good mood to do the activities and to participate actively in the activities that we promote. Are we offering support to our learners during this crisis? Because of course, um, this reality doesn't escape from what we're living. And sometimes the students, they need to talk about it. They need to get informed about that. And somehow we as teachers, we need to consider what's going on in the real life to talk about that in our language lessons. And that obviously will give place for discussion. And of course, are we promoting well-being in our practice? And if so, how? So it's like um, making our students aware that they need to take care of themselves, they need to take care of their households and how they are doing it. So Vicky says, students learning and support are flexible much more, yes. So there is a lot of teaching going on in virtual classroom, but not necessarily a lot of learning. Yeah, exactly. So it means that the priority, even though we're here focused on students learning, we are much more flexible. And I would dare to say we're much more human because now we realize that there are things that could affect a person's motivation. Um, and of course, their, their health and the conditions they are living in. I know that there are teachers that they have had the chance to see the reality of the students' houses. Because um, sometimes they come from um, families that are violent, or they, that they do not receive the support, the right support for their family to learn. So Graham says, if teaching young learners involving parents and dealing with expectations is very important, hopefully teachers are getting support with this from their institutions, or this will involve more stress and work for teachers. And Vicky, my school has implemented several layers of the student family support, academic, social, emotional, and technical. That's good. So it means that we are not just talking about language learning, but we are referring, we're looking at um, our students as holistic human beings, that they have feelings, that they have problems, and especially during these circumstances, we can identify more with what they are living at the moment. Okay, so um, I must say 
that even though um, the teachers I'm working with, and in my case, using uh, video conferencing for my lessons, um, I have faced challenges, there are opportunities in video remote teaching. And some of the opportunities that have emerged from the information I've gathered so far is that it, it kind of promotes a closer connection. And I'm going to tell you why. The closer connection comes because the participants, each of the participants, including the teacher, they are at home. So it means that they are sharing an aspect of their personal life and somehow the students and the learners, they can identify with each other. So they can find a common aspect in their relationship. So that contributes to the connection between them. Also, that connection uh, reinforces rapport, which is also um, encouraged by sharing personal experiences and showing things. So I don't know if you saw my um, orchid. So this is my personal life. I love orchids, so I'm showing it to you. So maybe if one of you likes orchids, we could talk about that later on. So you can see I'm showing you one aspect of my life, and you can see the background of my living room at the same time. So that aspect of sharing some things of our personal lives and using it as a realia for language teaching that also contributes to language learning and to edge or establish a better relationship between students and students and students and teachers. And another opportunity is the convergence of context. Obviously, when we talk about the normal life, it means the classes in the classroom with four walls. Um, there is a context that comes from the curriculum. Yeah, we have the curriculum, and then we have the school, which is another context, and then we have the classroom, which is another context. In this case, obviously, we continue working with the curriculum or the established content. Um, and then we have that context that is converging with the context of our homes, that is also converging with the context that we create in the video conferencing room, which is another context. And in that, uh, in that space, we have access to audio and to images, okay? Because at the moment you are listening to me and you can see me, so somehow I am representing an image, even though you cannot see me in person. So it's that convergence of context. So we can use that, those contexts, as I told you, our personal life, our homes, and the, the space we create through the tool and take advantage of them to promote communication among the students and do activities that actually promote the participation and the students' ownership of their own learning. Another opportunity is uh, the teacher as a resource. So in this case, I try to be a resource for you, talking about my orchids and showing you the flowers. Uh, but I want to give you an example. I'm working with Hands Up Project, which is an education charity, um, um, giving learning language learning opportunities, more language learning opportunities to kids in Palestine. And Nick Bilbra, he actually uses Facebook Live to do some of the sessions. And in that case, in this particular case, he was using, he was trying to represent or trying to perform a physical story. He's here with us, I guess. So he can write a bit more about that. So in that case, um, he asked the students to create a short story at the moment. One of the students created it. So the teacher, Nick, he performed the story and he became a resource. And I'm going to show you the video back here. Okay. I was walking on the farm. I saw a dog. I saw a dog. 
What happened next? I saw a dog. The dog was asleep. The dog was asleep. The dog was asleep. The dog is sleeping. Can you hear the dog sleeping? The dog is snoring. The dog is dreaming. The dog is dreaming. On the farm, I saw a dog. I saw. I was walking on the farm. I was walking on the farm. Okay, so. I'm going to share the slides again at the moment, and I would like to see your comments. So I wanted to show you the aspect of the teacher as a resource. And in that particular case, um, as I said, Neep was using the student's language production as an example. So it means that addressing what the student did is actually praising the work that they've done. And at the same time, he was using his body language to recreate the scene and he was taking advantage of the video frame. So who is in the video frame? The teacher. So he is using the resources he has available, which is his body, his uh, voice, to make the movements and recreate the story. So um, some of the comments here, it says, see, I'm trying to read. Um, Isabel says, the teacher as a resource is something I research as well. That's so interesting, Mary Carmen, yes. <laughs> we agree on that. Uh, Graham says, you can read the interview with me and learn more about the Hands Up Project. And you have the link um, in the chat box. And then, Bona says, while well, it may sound obvious, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, while it may sound obvious, technical problems are one of the main stumbling blocks of online training. Yes, that's true. Um, even though we are in 2020, I think this varies from countries, and the conditions of the countries, but there are ways to overcome such obstacles. Um, learning from home can be lonely without the buzz of the classroom setting and the company of their peers. It's no surprise that some students can begin to feel a strong sense of isolation that slowly erodes their desire to learn. So that's why I was mentioning the aspect of the context, because obviously they are isolated, they do not have contact with their classmates, maybe just during the video conferencing call. So why not using that aspect or those opportunities to create or to promote language learning or to um, design an activity that combines those aspects and make it more enjoyable for the participants. Okay, so now um, um, this is another opportunity that video remote teaching offers and it's uh, referred to variable interaction patterns. And I wanted to think about the verbal interaction patterns that you see in your practice. Is it um, unidirectional? It means from the teacher to the students only, or is it from the uh, unidirectional from the students, one of the students making a presentation to the teacher and the students, or do you think it's multidirectional? So I'm going to read your comments um, about that. What kind of verbal interaction patterns do you see in your sessions? Uh -huh. I've always wondered if video conferencing encourages more teacher-student interaction, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. We could invite, uh, this is a question, we could invite guest speakers, native or non-native speakers to enrich their resource idea. And this would be a real opportunity of live online sessions. Yes multi-directional. Um, Heidi, can you tell me how you do that multi-directional part? How do you make it multi-directional? Uh, Grand mentions you have to try hard to avoid a teacher center approach. Yes, multi-directional is more chaotic in terms of background noise. Students have learned to mute and mute themselves for more effective communication. Yes, so in that case, uh, from my participants, I have seen or have found these patterns. Obviously, teachers, students, that has to do more with lectures. At the moment, uh, I'm trying to avoid the lecture type uh, pattern because I am the only one talking. That's why I ask you questions during my presentation to see how active you are during the session and in that way what you the comments you make i try to address them so you feel that i'm taking into account what you're saying but that is one of the the patterns there is another pattern which is the student making a presentation but again it's unidirectional is the student just talking to the rest of the teacher and the students obviously there are these these patterns can give place to other patterns because the teacher can start the class which is unidirectional and then can promote an activity in which the students can work with each other in pairs or in groups in my case i like the multi-directional uh, maybe because sometimes i like the mess because I don't know, I just feel that when everybody's talking is when they are more engaged in what they are doing. So um, in that case, I realized I did one of the activities and I was participating like a host, television host. And this activity was with the students, they were all candidates, they were applying for a job. So it was a role playing game. They were applying for a job in a company this was with undergraduate students and in that case they had to realize that there was a person who was not a real candidate okay so they need to discover who that person was so they started asking questions to each other because they were trying to get a job and in another activity uh, they were supposed to be in on an island and i gave them a role which is was crazy for example a, a priest um a hairdresser so they needed to justify to the rest of the groups why they were valuable and then they needed to eliminate one of the candidates so it means that they needed to ask questions to kind of see the flow of the candidate and of course at the end i was just a moderator and at the end the two left um candidates they needed to decide if they wanted to share their position or not without talking to each other so it was quite everybody was a bit um intrigued about the answer and who was going to get the job sometimes none of them got it sometimes one of them so it varied from group to group and of course i really loved that activity because I felt that I was moderating and everything was coming from the students. So they were so engaged that they were producing language and they were not that worried about the mistakes they were making. Of course, at the end of the session, I gave them feedback, presenting maybe some structures or some vocabulary that they needed to work on. But I felt in that session, I felt that my students enjoyed and I enjoyed as well. So those are the different types of verbal communication patterns that video conferencing tool offers. And maybe we can say, okay, we're doing video conferencing and it's just a lecture. And I think, I really think there are ways to do, it, to do activities. And I have seen it from my participants as well. There are ways to promote communication and make the students um, talk to each other and they are the ones developing the session without even realizing. Um, let me see some of the comments. So, five comments. 
So Haiki says, I have very small groups, plus I like the Zoom breakout rooms. Yes, that's, that's a good one because um, they, there are people who like to work in the smaller groups, so, and you can check if they are uh, participating. I think they feel more confident talking to each other in smaller groups. Um, Isabel, breakout rooms work well for group or couple work, yes. Um, Graham, I suggest starting a small, building learner training into classes so students get to know different features of the video conferencing tool. Yeah, that's an important aspect because sometimes um, the teacher has to act also as a technician um, because you need to provide help about how to use the tool. But um, most of the students, even though they don't know how to use the tool, they learn very quickly because they are more used to technology down, nowadays than when we were um, used to. Um, okay, so another opportunity is for teacher collaboration. And in this one, I'm talking about um, uh, this kind of collaboration is common in K-12 language education. Um, and I would mention the Hansa Project for Palestine and the Project Volunteer Online in China. So there is a remote teacher that works with a teacher in a classroom. Um, so they collaborate with each other. So there is opportunity for teacher development, if obviously the relationship between them works. Um, nowadays, in these circumstances, challenging times or challenging circumstances, um, whatever you, you prefer to call it, whatever you are, depending on the place you are. Um, there is a different kind of collaboration. There is a collaboration between the teacher and the parents if we are talking about K-12 learners. Um, but of course, that would be an interesting topic for another webinar. Now, to conclude, I would like to mention these two, um, I would like to make reference to these two thoughts. One of them is from the structuration theory, uh, and this one has to do with the original use of a tool, of a technological tool. But in this case, the theory mentions that the function of any technological device or application is determined by what the users do with it which can modify its original conception and utility. And video conferencing is one of the cases. This tool was created for businesses to have meetings, um, but now it is used even for personal communication because of the pandemic that we're living. It is used for sport because I have seen trainers doing their sessions in Instagram Live and Facebook Live and people can have access to it. Um, I've seen also interviews. So you can see how one technological tool was created and, and, and started with a definite utility, but the users are the ones that create or modify the original conception of the tool. And of course, this one comes from my own experience coming from a, a, a country in challenging circumstances that in times of crisis, reinvent yourself and by that i mean that you have to go with the flow that you have to be flexible because sometimes when you are trying to control things it is more difficult and it adds more stress and you don't get the the, the right outcomes so that's why i say in times of crisis reinvent yourself especially the way you see the world and the way you see the work you are doing and the perception that you have about your teaching practice and the perception you have about um, your students learning. So um, that was my presentation. <laughs> thank you very much for listening and thank you very much for the comments. I really loved um, looking at the comments and uh, reading your insights. So now, if you want to say something, if you want to use the microphone, you can activate it, or we can give you permission to activate it. Um, yeah. Or if you prefer to write a comment, then write a comment in the chat box. Thank you, Mari Carmen. It was very, very interesting, everything you Thank said. You. And uh, I have been following the chat closely. Um, all the comments were related to what you were speaking at the time. 
uh, and you have already looked at it. So if any, I don't have any questions that were left unanswered. Uh, if there are questions now, you can either request to have your microphone unmuted or, or uh, type them in the chat box, please. We still have some time, so Mari Carmen can answer those questions. Thank you, Mari Carmen. Uh, that was you. really interesting. Thank you for sharing your experience. Um, I've got a question for you while we're waiting for mm -hmm. others to, um, to, to think of questions. Uh, um, when you first started using video conferencing, if you can remember that, mm -hmm. what, what were your personal, um, what were the most difficult things that you experienced when you first started doing it? Well, actually, I started, I think it was in 2008. I was still in my undergrad years. Um, I actually loved it because I was studying and I was about to finish my career. And I think it was something different. And I like things that are different and that are challenging. So I tried to learn it. And obviously, at the beginning, I felt that it was more like lecture type. But I knew that there were, because it's communication at the end of the day. So, and we face the same, I, some of the challenges are the same that we face in a, in a classroom, you know, with the students. That sometimes we can talk too much and do a lecture. So that was what I felt at the beginning when I was using it, that it was like a lecture and that there was no opportunity for the students to speak. But I know that there are opportunities for improvement and I think with this tool, you realize, you come to the realization that you are talking too much and that you need your students to participate more. So you realize, especially if you look at the recordings, um, there are teachers that they look at the recordings and they do reflection on it. They realize um, the things that they are doing and the things that they would like to improve. But again, I mean, I'm not judging and I think every teacher has their own style and there are conditions as well that make you do things. So I think it depends on, on everyone's reality and, and the circumstances that they are living. Thank you. Yeah, I find that very interesting that um, I think every technology that you use tends to have an effect on, on your practice in some way. So the interactive whiteboard, for example, uh, if anyone ever used that, tended to promote a kind of teacher-fronted, teacher-centered approach to teaching. And you had to really fight against that to change it. As it, it tended to sort of um, get you in front of the class uh, at a board. Mm -hmm. um, but there were ways around that. In the same way that, as you said, video conferencing, I think um, certainly when people are starting, I find that it, it tends to um, encourage a more teacher-centered approach as well, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I think yeah. that when you are learning something new, you start from your comfort zone. So, so for, I mean, if you're starting to use video conferencing, you're going to start using something that you feel comfortable with or something that you consider it's going to be easier for you to handle. And once, when, once you get the confidence and you realize that you need to make changes is when you come to realize, okay, I need to add a different um, approach to what I'm doing. Yeah. But at the I beginning of your right. you learning, it's, it's like, okay, I'm getting to know the tool. I'm going to do something that I know how to do. And most of the time, um, lecture type um, presentations are well known. Um, if I can share the experience where I'm working, my, the school where I'm working now, which is a primary school, um, I think the guidance from, from the, the, the heads is very, very important. And we have a system in place, which is the combination of a learning management system to upload all the materials and uh, uh, video conferencing sessions with the students. And it has become clear from the very beginning that the objective of the uh, video sessions is to promote student interaction uh, and not to have this, the teacher talking. And, 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 and 
And so we have been using the learning management system to upload the materials that the students need to watch before or whatever, if you want in a kind of flipped learning uh, approach. Uh, and we have been using the class to, uh, to, to maximize the students' opportunities for speaking, which is what they, they can't do, okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually like the idea that Grams um, presented in Ayatafel last year about the state room. But of course, it depends on the age of the, of the learners as well, because if, you, if we are teaching to K-12 or very young learners, it's different. And in that Absolutely. case, yeah, in that case um, I think I, I, I would like to mention the work of Hansa Project with the storytelling because they do storytelling for young learners. So they try to use realia and they try to use the, the right vocabulary and pace for the learner's level and age. And also uh -huh. the number of students in your class is a, mm -hmm. a, yeah. a, a big yeah. game changer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you have five is one thing, uh, or yeah. you have 20 or more, it's a whole different yeah. thing. Yeah, I, I have one of my participants, um, I think she's in Argentina as well, and she had to shift to video conferencing, and in that case was for English for academic purposes. So now she has 30 participants. But um, at the beginning, she was worried because she didn't know if they were actually understanding what she was teaching and, and she wanted them to participate more. But I think she's started to make some changes based on what, it, what she has been saying and reading and, and looking at. So I think um, belonging to a community of practice is also useful because you learn from the experience of other teachers. Um, and in, at the end of the day, I mean, it's not about saying that, okay, I know what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing, it's right. No, sometimes you really need to see what other people are doing and that can give you some kind of inspiration and idea to make changes. Um, I think uh, there are some questions in the chat box. Um, hi, Key, how do you combat the frontal teaching mode of video conferencing and its strategies? Um, well, I like the part of the role playing strategies because the students, they actually, they have like an outcome that they have to get to and they have to do it. So they, they participate and they talk to each other. But again, it depends on the number of students you have in the video conferencing room. And also, I think the idea of the escape room, I really love that idea because I like games. So I prefer to use games because you are really immersed in a different reality and that makes you forget about any anxiety that you can have to make a mistake in a foreign language. I really, I really like the idea of stories. More and more, um, I've yeah. started experimenting with interactive stories. So the kind of mm -hmm. things that Nick mm -hmm. and, and the Hands Up Project do. Uh, but you can do that at all levels, at all ages. And the, the benefit of that, if it's interactive, I think, uh, is that you can really... Um, you can really foster a lot of engagement and communication. I think if you if you have the right story, if it if it can motivate and provoke. I'd actually I'd actually like to pick you pick up pick up something you mentioned briefly, Mary Carmen, mm -hmm. if I may, yeah. about uh, recording yourself. Because one of the things I find um, I I think there are some benefits of of this form of teaching, and one of those benefits that doesn't seem so obvious at first um, is this idea of, of re making recordings of, of your classes. Mm -hmm. Obviously you need permissions in place yeah. and you yeah. need to be very, um, you know, upfront and honest about what you're mm -hmm. going to do with those recordings, whether they're for personal reflective use for your teacher, whether you're going to share them to, with colleagues, et cetera, mm -hmm. or, or even publicly in conferences mm -hmm. or presentations. But I think the benefit of doing that is enormous. Being, if, you can, if you can bear watching yourself um, yeah. <laughs> teach or teach a training, then yeah. it's amazing what you can spot that you wouldn't mm -hmm. normally know. I mean, one of the best professional opp development opportunities I ever did was, it wasn't an online class, but I videoed a, a young learner class that I did. Um, and then sat through it with my line manager at the time. And he yeah. just paused and started pointing out things that 
and and made me and my practice completely changed because of that so i would recommend that but also not only watching it back yourself but if you can um watch it back with a colleague if you can do that or part of it and um and get that colleague to to give you tips and stuff i don't know if you've if you've done much of that have you yeah yeah that's actually one of them lines of my research um but it's a bit risky because in that case you would have to select a critical friend who is Mm. here and someone you feel comfortable with and just like say accepting the criticism in a positive way um so it's a bit tricky because sometimes we tend to see criticism as judgment and we feel a bit attacked but there are ways um i think there is one called collaborative practice in which the other person asks you questions to make you reflect of what you did and why you did it so in that part of what you did and why you did it you realize what you were thinking at the moment and what was affecting you, if it was something circumstantial, if it was because of the circumstance, if it was because of the learner's reaction to what you were doing. So um, obviously with reflective practice, because that's um, reflective practice, video-based reflections, um, you come to a, a resolution. So one of the cases that I mentioned with Microsoft Teams and the resolution is a change that you would like to make in your practice to change that aspect. And that can give place also to professional improvement because you may feel the need to read more about a specific um, element or theme or topic related to your practice or to look for people who know how to handle that part or to look for advice. So it's like recognizing the aspects that you need to work on and then look for solutions on that. Yeah, may I, may I add, um, because uh, we were discussing in the chat box at the same time, mm-hmm. this, this thing about permissions to be able to record classes. Uh, when we started with the pandemic, we had permission from parents to record classes, but as, as the first weeks went by, Uh, Many families came back to us saying that the kids were really anxious and worried about the class being recorded. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they were not themselves really. And so we stopped recording altogether. So sometimes it's, uh, it it goes beyond the idea of permission. It's like the the flow of the class is kind of altered when they know Mm. it's being recorded. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite interesting, isn't it? I think I know, for example, Uh, a university that does before the pandemic did a lot of online teaching uh, Mm -hmm. and um, they have it written that all of their classes are recorded every Mm -hmm. single one Mm -hmm. and all the teachers and students before taking the courses uh, have to have to agree to that Um, and the reason for the recordings is partly it's what what the recordings are used for professional development so they pick Mm. out moments of good practice to share with other people Um, but also they use the recordings as a way of um, almost of controlling quality and actually observing teachers so instead of having normal observations an observer would actually look at pick at random a class and observe Mm. just just to make sure that everything is okay and also then to give feedback to the teacher involved, um, you know, I think that's quite an interesting thing. But there is this idea of, you know, both this anxiety effect of, yeah. of the teacher. If, if that, I, the first thing that struck me was that the teacher must feel under constant observation if all mm-hmm. of the classes are, oh, yes. are being recorded. Uh, mm-hmm. There must be an extra level of stress, yeah. but also, as you said, Vicky, I think it's quite interesting the effect that it has on the students if they feel yeah. that everything they do is being recorded. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm in two minds about it. I can see the benefits, yeah. but I also see that it could cause a lot of uh, stress and anxiety. Yeah. So um, just picking up uh, what Vicky mentioned about the consent. Yes. Um, obviously, when you're working with K-12 or younger learners, you need to get the consent from the parents who are the legal guardians. But 
you also need to consider that the students have a voice, whatever the age they have. Yeah. So it means you can get the, the legal consent from the parents, but you need to inform the learners and you, can, you yeah. should ask them if they agree with participating in a session that is going to be recorded and making sure, I mean, informing them what you're going to use the video for. Yeah. And I think that's one mm -hmm. of the things that strike people. That, okay, what are you going to do with that video? Are you going to show it in social media? Are you going to show it on TV? Um, obviously, you can find people who say, oh, I would like to be in social media for people to see me. But there are people who do not like that. So mm -hmm. making sure what you're going to be using the video for and informing the participants what it is for. If you say that it's for, for professional development, and it's only you, the one who's going to watch the recording, I think that reduces a bit the anxiety from the people yeah. who are mm -hmm. going to participate mm -hmm. in the session. Um, another, another cause of anxiety during video uh, sessions is that the classroom used to be a closed space, you know, your, your space where you were with, the, with your students. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's in the home. So students are sitting probably in the living room yeah. with their parents sitting next to them watching <laughs> mm -hmm. the class too. So mm -hmm. uh, the teacher is exposed all the time to parents' observation as well. And the kids are also being observed by the parents as to how they behave during class. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also worth noting that that causes yeah. a lot of anxiety. Yeah. yeah. That, and that's a, an interesting aspect to, to research as well, like the support the students are receiving from the parents and the level of anxiety or the perception the teachers have about the parents participating in the sessions. Um, I mentioned the school accountability because sometimes we're so focused on getting the students to learn a content and to get a good grade that, I mean, I really think that our lives change a lot during the pandemic and the priority and the way to tackle things should be different than it used to be. So the students are five hours sitting in front of the computer. I mean, imagine a kind of static student sitting in front of the computer during five hours, listening to people talking. That is a bit demotivating for the student as well. Yeah, it's all very interesting. I think this whole thing of the parents being the observers needs, needs some kind of management by the organization your institution yeah. or school really mm -hmm. i think the parents need to know the expectations and the protocol needs to be in place doesn't Absolutely. it i think yep. to you don't want parents interrupting the lessons or they, they complaining have i'm sure they the, have but yeah. it's almost we've like you need send, we've had to send to write down a document and send it to all families with the protocol exactly. with what mm -hmm. they are expected to do and not to do because yeah. they were kind of interrupting or telling the students the answers to the questions or things yeah. like that. It's, it's really interesting because it, it changes the whole idea of a classroom. If the students yeah. are at home, you know, is there a, is there an adult if they are you know, if they're yeah. children, is there an adult in the room? Should there be an adult in the room? <laughs> If there isn't an adult in the room, is the student behaving? Because there's not a lot you can do if the student disappears. Yeah. Um, is there a sibling playing? Is there a to sibling? Him? <laughs> is, you know, do, and then the, the kind of, you know, the, the, the home situation of the, the students may mean that there isn't a place where they can actually have a quiet space to themselves yeah. uh, for a class. So that, that increases the anxiety and the stress. Mm -hmm of mm -hmm. both for the, everybody for everybody <laughs> so there's all sorts of things going on and i don't know about everyone here but um you know i'm starting to get reports that that even though schools are going back for example in uruguay of which i'm, I'm mm -hmm. part of managing the project there um that they don't force the ministry of education don't foresee a complete return of children to the schools even in the long term they think that they'll start going to school some of them will start going to school two days a week three days a week and they see blended learning as being a kind of a feature of the future of education there mm -hmm. that means all sorts of things that we've just mentioned about 
you know, connectivity, about equality of education, that in the school you can more or less try to guarantee, but you can't if you depend upon an internet connection, for example. Yeah, yeah. And there are students who do not have internet connection as well, or the devices to, to be part of the activities. So that also another element to consider. Yeah, well, I think, I think Heike has come on, on screen no, because I think one, one we're running thought. out of time. Is that right? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not the timekeeper, that's okay. Oh, I but thought I you like were, I could just share one thought, uh, which I've been put to, because uh, right now there's a lot of talk about um, investing in order to get the economy back online. And um, I kind of heard that um, a, lot, a lot of money or a lot of investors are looking to uh, professionalize this live online teaching in such a way that there will be likely a lot of funds available for teacher training because the teachers have had to cope with this situation without any training yeah. whatsoever. But now as we are going into a settling phase and long-term uh, school projects in that way, yeah. um, there's a real opportunity for professional teacher training on a larger scale, even getting teachers together in live online settings to to share best practice and i think it's wonderful marie carmen that you mentioned all of this just now it has been such a delight from a teacher who's practicing it and also from somebody who's observing others and graham your thought about um self-reflection on the recordings it's just fabulous thank you so much oh, thank you very much Jackie. <laughs> I didn't want yeah. to, to do the closing word. Mm -hmm. The closing word is over to Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, wanted to before, be grateful. <laughs> before, mm -hmm. before we hand over to Vicky, let me just thank you, Mary Carmen, for this uh, presentation and the discussion afterwards. Yeah. I think it's been really interesting. Uh, so mm -hmm. thank you very much for, for doing that. Um, okay. I'll now hand over to Vicky so she can mm -hmm. say the final words and then we'll stop the recording. My <laughs> Final words, there. thank you, Mary Carmen, so much for this <laughs> session. I think it was food for thought for everybody on, on the current uh, challenging times and circumstances in many cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, so thank you from LTC for agreeing to do this. Uh, thank you. Recording will be available very soon. Um, and uh, uh, be alert for uh, our next webinar, which hasn't been confirmed yet. Watch thank you space. well thank you very much it's been, it has been lovely and i really enjoy exchanging these these reflections and ideas and actually it's also put for thought for me because i learn from what other people comment and their perspective so i think i'm going to write something by now <laughs> before i forget it so thank you very much and thank you very much for the invitation okay, okay. so everybody if you want to come on camera and give a big round of applause to Mark Carmen and uh, <laughs> thank her for this session. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> good to see. It's good to see so many familiar faces that are coming back again and again every Friday. So thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs> okay, Nick, we know you're there. <laughs>